Well, hello, and welcome to Bio211. We are Anatomy and Physiology 1, um, and this is for Norwalk Community College. And what we're doing now is we're moving into Chapter 5, and inside Chapter 5, what we're looking at is the integumentary system. So in the previous chapters, what we've done is we've looked at how do we build a cell. If we make cells, what are the different types of tissues we make? And now what we want to do is we want to make sure you understand that what we're going to do is we're going to take individual types of tissues. Remember, there are four different types of tissues. We're going to build this system, and this system, of course, is the integumentary system. And this is, of course, the epidermis here. And this is the dermis. And this is the hypodermis, or subcutaneous, EDH, right? And what I want to make sure everybody understands is that is what covers, obviously, I think everybody gets this, right? But because it's a system, what you need to make sure you understand as well, you put an eyeball there, an eyeball there, and put a smiley face on you right there because you're in correct anatomical position, right? Is that obviously if it's part of a system and it has all of the components of all of the four different tissue types, then it's going to have different responsibilities depending on where and when it's being used. But that means it also has inside of it hair nails and glands, which are all made up of epithelia that take different shapes. To support this though, we need to make sure blood vessels move into a space. So let's make sure you understand where that's happening. Blood vessels move into a space, utilize diffusion to keep all of that alive. Right? right? So if this is the dermis, it feeds the epidermis, because remember the rules of the epidermis are it has a free apical surface, it doesn't have any vascularization. In yellow, let's make sure we switch over to yellow here, yellow, we can actually have nerves that travel up to actually innervate this area, but also detect information down here and say the pacinian corpuscle of the hypodermis or the ruffini corpuscle here inside that there, okay? Which means, there's going to have some responsibility for musculature here, and that musculature will take care of uh, our response to things, meaning should we get cold or should we sense something, the hairs on our skin will stand up straight. And there, of course, is nervous system innervation. Long-winded introduction, but hopefully you now will remember that the epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis are all part of the integumentary system, and the integumentary system covers your entire body. Okay. Uh, of course, it's going to be different depending on where we're using it. And, you know, if you just think about the simple distinction, say thick skin versus thin skin, thick skin is going to be found in the palms of the hands, the fingertips, and the soles of the feet. Okay, cool. So, what does the skin do? Well, we can use it for regulation of body temperature, which makes sense if you think about when you watch the heat be removed from the surface of the skin. So if we let blood flow to the surface of the skin, we will remove heat from inside the body. Simultaneously, we actually make your skin highly vascularized. So let's go increase ink vasc. Okay, and if we need to store some blood there for a period of time, we can. Simultaneously, we can temporarily divert it there and it can actually act for other reasons. And we can see the change in the pigmentation. Obviously, everybody understands that, I say obviously, um, everybody understands that the purpose, the most fundamental purpose of your skin is to keep things outside. Things outside and inside. Okay? And that's what we mean by protection. All the wee beasties that are covering you right now, all the mites, all the bacteria, all of that, they want to get inside and turn you into hamburger helper. You want to keep them outside. Utilizing those nerves we spoke about in the previous slide, you can actually detect D -E -T -E -C, the outside world. Okay. Excretion will be glands, and those glands will be the things that will actually move materials onto the body. We don't tend to talk about absorption so much, but if, uh, if you understand that if it's lipid soluble, meaning the skin is made up of phospholipids, therefore it could be lipid soluble. If you could put a lipid soluble drug on the surface of the skin, you could then deliver it into the body. That is the m mechanism by which uh, smoking cessation patches work and stuff like that, okay? 
The one that's probably m incredibly important but doesn't get a whole lot of viewing time until chapter 18, right? And that's the synthesis of vitamin D, where what happens is the pro form of vitamin D, okay, is activated by the presence of UV radiation. This is why you go out for a walk in the sunlight every day. Walks. Whoops. Right? And what it's responsible for is increasing calcium availability for usage inside the body. Okay? The active form is called calcitriol. Calcitriol regulates, one, the removal of loss of calcium from your urine, but also the increase of calcium from your digestive tract. Okay? Calcium is an important element inside of the functioning of our body. The structure of skin itself is a cutaneous membrane. It has about two square meters and it's fairly thin in some places, one to two millimeters, and fairly thick in other places. It's thinnest inside your eyelids and thickest on your heels. Don't memorize any of that. That's more like um, you, you might use that at pub crawl night or pub quiz night. What you do need to understand, though, is that there's an epidermis, which is made up of epithelial cells, okay? And then there's the inner, thicker layer that's called the dermis. And deep to the dermis is the hypodermis, which your textbook also calls subcutaneous. Okay, all of those are correct definitions and descriptions. What I want you to do is take a look now at the canonical picture, right? Where you have epithelial cells that are, rid that are arranged along this ridge that's called the papillary region. If you take a look at the epidermal region here, you can see how they interdigitate in between one another. And that increased surface area is why you can't remove epithelia from the dermis without great force. Deep to that ridge, you're going to see here inside the dermis all of the associated structures, say glands, hair follicles, uh, where is it, erector pili muscles, so you actually have musculature here. You can see that you actually have nervous system innervation to the hair root plexus, but also the erector pili muscle here. And also down here, you have your Pacinian corpuscle down there, and there should be some other sensory devices inside here. The point being that you actually can detect starting from the hair root all the way down to the hypodermis contact with this integumentary system. Okay. The epidermis is made up of keratinized stratified squamous epithelia. Okay. It is one of the four major cell types okay, that are found inside the tissue itself. The next major population are melanocytes. They produce a pigment that's melanin and is going to be shared with the adjacent cells and you increase the amount of melanin you make as you increase the amount of ultraviolet radiation to the skin. The next set of cells are Langerhan cells, and these are involved inside immune responses, and they're made inside your red bone marrow, but what you need to understand is that they're antigen-presenting cells, and their job is to look for other, or foe, okay? And it runs back to your immune system and says, look what I've found. Finally, we have Merkel cells which function in the sensation of touch, okay? And they work with another population of cells, and I'll show you that in a second. So here's a mature keratinocyte, essentially dead. It has some granules inside of it. It has lots of keratin inside of it. And we'd probably call this the stratum corneum because it's the dead layer. And we'll talk about the different stratums in a moment or strata in a moment, right? But th below it, or more towards the basale side, is going to be these population of cells that are the melanocytes. They make the melanin granules that were then made and put into this. And as you increase the amount of tan you get, you increase the number of granules you have. Those Langerhans cells, remember, they're antigen-presenting cells. They're essentially fancy white blood cells running around pr protecting your body from foreign pathogens. And here's that Merkel, or tactile cell, that's in touch with the tactile disc which is part of a sensory neuron. So it works as a unit to get information inside. What I want to do now is I want to switch and think about what is the epidermis and how it is we actually use it, okay? And we're going to go over the basic definitions uh, for both thick and thin skin. There are five layers in thick. There are four layers inside thin. They all start with the most deep layer and that's the stratum basale, and it's constantly undergoing cell division. So just a quick review of cell division. Remember, cells grow to a specific size. They replicate their genetic information. Then they continue growing, and then they undergo a mitotic separation of that genetic information to form two smaller cells. 
Well, if this is happening continuously, that means the stratum basale is continuously duplicating epithelial cells, which they only have one way to grow, and that's up. And as they grow up, they become part of the stratum spinosum. Okay, and as they mature from the stratum spinosum, they become the stratum granulosum. And this is where they're making ketohyalin and granules inside of that space, meaning the cytosol. In the process, though, they're actually dying. Because if it's thick skin, we'll have another layer, which is the stratum lucidum, which is found on the fingertips, palms, and soles of your feet. So it's fingertips of your hands, palms of your hands, and soles of your feet. Let's go like that. And then finally they become, if they're dead, dead keratinocytes, the stratum corneum, okay? And should you increase friction on those tissues, right? What you end up creating is a callus. This is where all your calluses come from on the hands, your palms of your hands when you're doing manual labor, okay? What does it look like? Well, here's the cartoon version inside your textbook, where if deep is here, the stratum basale, you can see this is the rep representation of continual cell division. Here's a Merkel cell attached to the Merkel sensory neuron via the Merkel disc. And up here is the Langerhans cells. These cells are still alive, so it's patrolling the environment and going, who's here that doesn't belong here? You'll see that they're actually using cell adhesion molecules to attach to one another. And then as they go forward to the granulosum here, they're making those granules. By the time they get to the corneum, obviously they're dead. You'll notice that the actual cytosol looks like it's been removed, but essentially it's intermediate filaments and water repulsive triglycerides or materials inside of here. Over here is a little bit less clear, right? Because here's the actual photomicrograph artist representation. Photomicrograph, you can see what's going on in terms of the separations. What about that dermis, though? Because all of this has to sit on a dermis. And if you remember from the epithelial discussion inside Chapter 4, all epithelial cells have to sit on a basement membrane. Well, the basement membrane is a fancy dermis. Okay, maybe that's the other way around. The dermis is a fancy basement membrane. Yeah, that sounds better. Closest to it is the papillary re region, which is areolar or connective tissue, which has a thin layer of collagen and elastic fi fibers. Okay. Below it is the reticular region, which is made up of dense, irregular connective tissue. That's the sort of stuff that people love testing you on. I'm not saying I do, I'm saying people do. They're like, do they remember exactly where they find dense, irregular connective tissue? Uh, I suppose it's important, maybe, okay. But if we think about what we did in class, part of the reason why the skin wasn't ripped off my arm was one, we have the papillary and epidermal ridges, increased surface area. By having dense irregular connective tissue inside the dermis, it makes it harder to find a point of failure between the epithelial cells, the dermis, the hypodermis, and the tissue below it. Inside the dermis, we're gonna find elastic fibers and collagen like we'd expect, as, as well as adipose cells storing triglycerides, hair follicles making hair, nerves detecting sensation, okay? Um, nerves mean you have sensation going in both directions, so this is the axons of nerves. Sebaceous glands, and for the disc, for going forward every time we're talking about sebaceous glands, we're creating oils that'll be produced and either put on hair follicles or put onto, meaning hair shafts or put onto the surface of the skin, and or sudiferous glands, which are sweat glands. And the only reason I remember them this way is because sweat glands create, create odor. I don't know why I see odor inside this name, but that's what my brain sees. Well, there's a structural basis for color, and that is the melanin is part of it. And remember, we increase the amount of melanin in our skin by increasing UV radiation to those cells. And what happens is it's supposed to absorb UV radiation to the cells that have picked it up. But even more, I guess more interestingly, I suppose you would say, where did it go? Where's uh, cleavage, melanin? Okay, so we're here. Um, the absence of melanocytes, of course, is albinism. If you eat too many yellow-orange pigments that are lipid-based, such as carotene, you can actually change the color into a yellow-orange state. If you think about when you were a kid, you ate all those carrots, your eyes turned yellow. And red color can be changed in your skin if you increase blood flow to your skin. If you think about those moments when you get embarrassed, like I call on you in class, and you turn, you turn an immediate red, okay? That's supposed to elicit in me some mirror cells that go, 
oh, the student is embarrassed and I should not ask them difficult questions. Well, it's not going to work. Okay. Uh, but in this case, what you've done is you've changed the skin color because you've increased the amount of red blood cells that are actually bound oxygen to them. Okay. So what's actually below this? Well, we call that the subcutaneous layer. Okay, it's also called the hypodermis. It's actually not part of the skin, but it's above, but among its functions, it's supposed to actually attach it to it. It also has piscinian corpuscles or lamellinated corpuscles inside of it, which is to detect external pressure applied to the skin. Okay, well, so if this is the case, and I've just given you like sort of the three major layers, so I'm sure you've noticed that I do include Oops, wrong color here. Let's go like this. Let's go like this. Skin is epidermis, dermis, hypodermis. Okay? And what you want to do is you want to make it functional. So you, therefore you bring in connective tissues, red blood cells, all that sort of stuff into the space inside the circulatory system to keep the epithelial cells alive. And we grow from basalate to corneum, right? So that's an arrow that's going up here. And then we have the hypodermis that's down here. Well, not a hypodermis, you don't actually attach the epidermis and the dermis to anything, okay? There's gonna be a fascia underneath here that's gonna be attached to it. Now what we can do is we can stop, actually we should probably pause, load this up, okay? We'll stop here and then we'll talk about the accessory structures you find inside of skin.